Jerry Evans is the owner of Turning Natural Juice Bars, which is now a staple in the Washington, D.C. area. Jerry and her late mother, Annette, began Turning Natural as a passion project to provide fresh and natural food to urban communities after her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Today, Turning Natural can be found in over six locations around Washington, D.C., and is available online for shipping nationally. Coming up, the moment that changed Jerry's life and business journey. So I was no longer passionate about what I was doing with Lockheed. By trade, I'm an aeronautical engineer. And so I was working on F-22 fighter jet, and I was like, I don't wanna do this anymore. How Jerry used her engineering background to start her business. I'm an engineer. There's two things that I use often, logic and systems. The steps that Jerry has taken to grow Turning Natural. Every lesson that I have learned about business has happened two ways, either through a book or a brick wall that I hit. And finally, what Jerry wishes she knew when she first started her business. Every five minutes, a fuse is blowing and you didn't realize that your residential electrician is totally different from a commercial. Up next, Hear how Square has helped Jerry transform and grow her business. People think of it as just a point of sale system. It is so much more than that. Coming up, why partnering with the right investors is critical. What does your team look like to be able to help me grow my company? Here's my growth strategy plan. Who in your team can help me accomplish that? So many of us have ideas for businesses, but often don't start them because we either don't know where to start or we feel like we must have everything figured out before we start. And after mentoring and working with so many women over the years, I've always shared the advice to just get started. So we've created a new segment on our Entrepreneurship podcast in partnership with Square for all of our entrepreneurs and founders to really hear actionable steps founders can take when you're ready to turn your idea of a business into an actual reality so that you can see that it is possible to just get started too. So Jerry, I would love to hear about the moment you knew you had to take the leap and just get started in your business. It kind of goes back to 2001, right? Uh, My mom was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer in 2001. And at that time it was, I was like 15. Um, So it was very devastating. But also at that time, we didn't have access to the information that we currently have now. And about two years before that, my aunt was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer oh and it, it went very fast. Um, she was diagnosed, she was very ill, and then she passed away. And so when my mom was diagnosed, we were kind of taken aback, right? Like it at that time, cancer was a death sentence for a lot mm-hmm. of people. And so life just drastically changed um, how we ate how we lived and where we went to the grocery store changed drastically. And so um, my mom started her business in 2005. So essentially it was my mother's business and it was a play on her last name, which was Turner. Her name was Annette Turner and Turning Natural was birthed through her. And so it didn't start out necessarily as juicing. It started out as her doing like natural remedies to kind of keep her in remission. And so around 2005, she was embarking on her five-year anniversary. And they say after five years, you're, you know, you are in the clear. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, that was not the case for my mom. So in 2010, it came back. It was much more aggressive. It spread to her bones and then it went to her liver. And literally within like two weeks of us finding out that it came back, my mom passed away. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So at the time, I was an aeronautical engineer. I was living in Atlanta, working for Lockheed Martin. And life for me was very dark. Um, You you lose your mom and you don't know what to do. That's not just your mother. It's your best friend. It's your gossip buddy. It's She's a little bit of everything to you. And so I was no longer passionate about what I was doing with Lockheed. By trade, I'm an aeronautical engineer. And so I was working on F-22 fighter jets and I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, This was at a tumultuous time for the country. We were also in a recession. We had just entered a recession and I quit my job and I had no idea that I was going to go into juicing. Um, But that's technically how I just started. Like I quit my job and I said, well, what am I going to do next? And it became like I wanted to bring health to people, right? Because my mom's story isn't unique. We know people with cancer. We know people with ailments. 
And I said, okay, I wanted to do something different. But at that time, I didn't know what different was. Mm -hmm. When you quit your job, did you know you were going to start a business at the time? Or did you know you just needed to stop what you were doing in that moment? You weren't passionate about it. And you were trying to first figure out what that next step was. I had no idea nor a desire to become an entrepreneur. Um, Like I said, I was in a very dark place. Mentally, I was not okay. Um, which in turn turned to physical, you know, my physical health depleting. I wasn't sleeping. I was depressed. Um, and now I have words for those things. At the time, I didn't. I wasn't sleeping. I was barely eating. If I was eating, I wasn't eating traditionally with my lifestyle represented. And I just knew I didn't want to do anything. I, wanted, I didn't want to do anything. How did you get through those really dark times and get to the other side and then ultimately find that passion and spark again? Yeah. So my personality will not allow me to just sit that long. Um, Even though for two years, I did absolutely nothing, but absolutely nothing. And then I realized like I am a whole adult that has responsibilities and bills. And I realized there was a lot going out and nothing coming in. And I decided I wanted to leave Atlanta and go home. Home is D.C., but I had no clue what I was going to do once I got home. And it it wasn't until I got home that people started asking me questions about stuff that my mom would provide them access to. So for like the last, I would say maybe 25 plus years, I've been brushing my teeth with neem toothpaste. I've been using a crystal deodorant. Like I was the weird kid at sleepovers that would have to like wet my crystal deodorant and put it on. And can you imagine like 12 and 13 year olds? Like, what is she doing? <laughs> Wait, I'm I'm actually so interested in this right now because I'm into like all of the natural stuff as well. And I know about crystals and I, I use natural deodorant, but I've never heard of crystal deodorant. So I'm yeah, actually so- trying to hear all about this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so before we became super advanced with all of these different options of natural deodorants, It was literally like a crystal that you had to like wet just to put on. And I would say like the first year wasn't the greatest. I didn't smell the greatest um, because it was a transition. And so by my mom having breast cancer, uh, specifically it was in her lymph nodes. So having cancer in your your lymph nodes, you want to be aluminum free. Like my mom Mm -hmm. drastically changed everything in our lives. Like how I wear a seatbelt to this day, you know, like I'm just so sensitive to anything related to my breasts, my bras, everything. Um, so yeah, before the the journey of true health became like, it was a part, like before the trend, I would say, became like everyone needs to be healthy. We were that weird, healthy family. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that's, that's where I said, I, you know, people started asking the question, of where can I find these natural soaps? Where can I find the natural deodorants? Where can I find the toothpaste that your mom was talking about? And I was like, this could be something. But naturally, I am an introvert, but I have social skills, right? So people think, oh, she's extroverted. I'm actually not. I'm very introverted. I just have very good social skills. And so I was like, well, how can I make money from this but not have to deal with the people so much? Right. And so I knew I didn't want to sell like deodorants and toothpaste and things like that. I don't want to be that type of natural girl. Um, And so, again, juicing was a big part of my mom's road to recovery. Um, She wasn't juicing for taste. She was juicing for health. And so at that point, it had become a lifestyle for me. And I was like, I wonder, can I get people to juice? But it can't taste like what my mother's juice tastes like. Uh, She was juicing straight greens. And we were like, this is not going to work. Um, and so I say, you know what? I want to be able to provide something that was cool, fun, and accessible to people. And so that's how I birthed the idea of juicing. Like I want you to have something good that you're putting in. Now, I don't want to sell soaps and incense and things like that. That's so interesting. So when you decided juicing was a thing and you were going to turn it into a business, what were some of those first steps that you took? Well, there's a lot of things you just don't know, right? Um, and so a big part of it, I was juicing in my kitchen. And one, you have health regulations that I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure I was breaking. Um, so in the beginning, we were doing a lot of juice cleanses for people. We weren't selling individual juices. And so our juice cleanses at the time consisted of six 16-ounce juices. And a lot of trial and error. My best friend was technically my first customer. She paid me $99. 
And we joke about it now because she did not drink all of the juices. <laughs> she just couldn't. She was like, I can't get through six 16 ounce juices. Um, and so a lot of that was just perfecting the product mm-hmm. first, right? Like not let's get rid of all of the the business stuff. It was like perfecting the product. How can I get people to want this product? And so what do I want? What do I know as far as health is concerned? How can I connect that with taste and make it where people like, I want this, I need this, gotta have it. Um, And so that was the first step. I perfected the product and then people started catching on. It was a lot of word of mouth. I did not put out anything. Like I didn't do, at the time, social media was like, kind of catching on, but it was more personal. It wasn't about businesses Mm -hmm. then. You said this Um, was 2010? This was 2013. 13, okay. Yeah, so we were still posting like these really grainy pictures. Totally. Like (laughs) it's That was like right after Instagram first launched. And even if you look back at old Instagram photos, it it was like that old, old Instagram photos that are just not that like old camera looking. (laughs) Yes, they look ancient. (laughs) And so this was prior to people actually promoting themselves on social media. And so, you know, I had a personal page and I really didn't talk about it because, again, I'm an introvert. Um, But it was a lot of word of mouth. And then the next step was after I had cleansed so many people, it was like, okay, this is exhausting. I cannot. And then people were actually exhausted from cleansing and they wanted individual juices. And so by trade, again, I'm an engineer. There's two things that I use often, logic and systems. And so I was like, it's not logical to deliver individual juices <laughs> because I'm not making any money like this. I made more money making cleanses. Um, and so I said, well, let's open a store. And in opening a store, you gotta remember, I left D.C. at 17. I never paid a full bill in Washington, D.C. as an adult. So moving back to D.C., which significantly was different from Atlanta, right, as far as cost and living, space, everything. Coming back to D.C., my apartment alone, I could barely afford. And so here I go, all ambitious, to go find a storefront. And the first space that I went to was on 14th and H in Northeast Washington, D.C. And the guy easily told me $7,000. I was like, I'm sorry. (laughs) Set <laughs> like seven thousand like U.S. dollars, um, and yes, seven thousand dollars. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to rethink this quickly um, because it wasn't just seven thousand dollars. You don't know anything about triple net leases, and you have mm-hmm. to have insurance, and then you're, the cost of build out, you know, permitting, all of that stuff. You have no idea. Um, but at the time, my godfather had a church. Uh, in Maryland. And he had this cafe that was about 350 square feet of space. And he was like, you know, do you want to use the space? And it petrified me. I was like, do I like here I go looking for a space in Washington, D.C. And then I have a space readily available to me. And I'm like, do I even want to do this? Like, this is something I really want to do. The idea of it was yes. But then the inside, again, I use logic can I do this? Like, what do I really know about business? And at the time I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. What gave you the courage to keep going? Well, one, it was my mom's legacy, right? Like something I was, I could be able to continue something that she was not able to do. And then also a part of the mission of turning natural is to bring healthy options to underserved communities. And so I'm not sure how familiar with, you told me you, you grew up in Maryland. So Anacostia, Southeast DC has been a food desert for majority of my life. And what I realized is that food deserts do not just affect specific economic groups or specific races. There are people who live in food deserts simply because they do not have access to healthy food options. And so growing up in Washington DC in Anacostia, there's still one grocery store that services over 50,000 people and the produce alone, it it looks like crap. And so for my mother to have to travel outside of our community just to go get access to better looking produce was an insult, right? And so this is a bigger issue than economic status and race. This is a government issue, right? And so that has been the mission, right? I wanted to bring access to healthy food options to communities that otherwise lack them. So you, you know, these days we call them food deserts or food insecure spaces. Um, and 
that has been the mission. And so those were the two things. I wanted to continue my mom's legacy and I wanted to bring affordable, accessible, healthy products. You mentioned a few times not knowing anything about business and learning as you go, which most founders can relate to. First time founders, you just figure it out as you go. So now you have this idea to open an actual location, not knowing anything. How did you figure it out? What And what were some of those learning lessons that you would share with someone else now who's thinking about starting a brick and mortar location? So I am an avid reader. I tell people every lesson that I have learned about business has happened two ways, either through a book or a brick wall that I've hit. (laughs) And so um, I did a lot of reading. And unfortunately, there isn't a blueprint of opening a juice bar in a book. Like I get people who reach out to me all the time and say, hey, can you tell me what it looks like to open a juice bar? And I'm like, how much time do you have? Because There's no way I can express to you in an hour or sitting down over a cup of coffee, you know, what those, all of those steps, because each time it was something different, right? Um, And so the first part, because we were inside of a space already, there was no permitting involved. Uh, There wasn't any licenses involved. We all, we fell under their license. And so within like nine months of being there, we quickly outgrew that space. And now we needed to go into another space. We found a space in the same plaza. It was 2,000 square feet. So 350 square feet where we're currently existing now to 2,000 square feet. I was like, okay, wait, this is a bit much. Um, And so YouTube was, (laughs) YouTube University definitely helped me get through, you know, the build out. The first part is the, the building inspections. And they're asking you questions about your electrical permit, your plumbing permit. Uh, And I'm like, I'm supposed to have this stuff? Like, can't I just pay someone to do it? And then you think it's that easy to pay someone to do it until a plumber comes and tells you to lay pipe is $35,000 that you don't have. So how do I get this done? There was a lot of things I just didn't know. And unfortunately, I did not have a tribe of people who were entrepreneurs that had built out spaces before that started a business from something to nothing. The business owners that I knew at the time were maybe barbers and hair salon owners. And, you know, they were even limited in their experience. And so a lot of it was just literally Shark Tank, YouTube, Google, reading, any resource that I could find, I literally was pulling everything I possibly could. Wow. What was the hardest part? Like once you got all of the information and now you had to execute it, what was what was the most challenging thing to accomplish? Okay, so January 4th, we opened our 2,000 square foot space and the outpour of like the line was out of like out the door. And I'm sitting there like, this is real. Like this is really happening. And then the next question immediately, I see all of these people And I'm like, how am I going to do this tomorrow? (laughs) Like, this is happening today, but how am I going to do this again tomorrow and then the next day and then the next day? Like, how do you continuously do this? And so it was just me and my my spouse at the time that was running the store. And I was like, I need like a team of people, but you don't know anyone. Like, who's going to want to work for me? Um, So my first hire was actually my best friend's brother. And he already had a job. So I was like, okay, if you can work Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from nine to three, and because those were hours, our store hours were from nine to three, and how customers were okay with that is beyond me. Um, And then I would work on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And a lot of times this journey, you don't, people don't tell you, like, I quit my job, right? But I had to go back to work because you have to finance this thing. And yeah, I had customers and money was coming in when I was in my godfather space. But now I've graduated to a 2000 square foot location. I now need more product. I have more customers and I need a team of people and I needed money. Yeah. <laughs> I needed money. Um, and so not all the time. I was very blessed to be able to be profitable early. Because I did, I did a lot of auctions for equipment. I could not afford a brand new commercial refrigerator. You have no idea 
the true cost of things until you're in it. And you're like, I know you're lying. $7,000 for a refrigerator wow. or how often fuses because you didn't have a proper electrician, you know, measure the amount of electricity from your blenders to your freezers to your refrigerator. So every five minutes a fuse is blowing and you didn't realize that your residential electrician is totally different from a commercial <laughs> electrician. I did not know that. Wow. Completely different. And so there were so many different things that we had to do as far as like, as we continue to grow and like grow on the spot. Um, but yeah, I had to go back to work because I had to finance this thing somehow. Um, because again, early on, you're talking about your a juice bar going into underserved communities to people that looks like a very crazy idea. Um, so no one's just throwing money at you. Did you apply for any grants or look at any alternative sources of funding at that time? Or did you know about any options to do so? At the time, I did not know. I was just so focused on the next day. Like, okay, we survived today. Let's survive tomorrow. And after I survive tomorrow, survive the next day. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, when you really start to grow and you realize, hey, I really need money to operate this thing. Um, that you start to find resources. So the first stop was to a bank. And again, to them, this was a crazy idea, right? It was a huge risk for them to take on. And we weren't asking for anything significant. I, I think I, I the first ask was like $75,000, right? Because in my mind, the debt, <laughs> you just don't want the debt. Like, I don't know if this is going to fail tomorrow, or I don't even know if I want to do this tomorrow, so let me just ask for something that I know is reasonable that I can potentially pay back within a good time frame. And they said no. And then you get multiple no's and then you're like, okay, forget it. I'm just going to hustle my way out of it, right? Like I'm just going to keep providing an excellent product. I'm going to keep, you know, trying to find customers. And then that's when social media started to become what it is now. It's like promote yourself and, and put it out there. And so people would send our information to other people. And so we grew in revenue, right? But I think people don't realize that revenue and cash flow are two totally different things. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, talk to me about social media. It starts taking off. Were you still only open at your physical location or did you launch e commerce as well? So, we did not launch e commerce. Um, so, this year, in December, we'll make 10 years that we have been in business. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. So our first location opened, te uh, technically our first location inside of my godfather's church was in 2012. I count that one like in my personal memories, but I don't count that one. I count our actual physical location where we were standing on our own. So 2013, and then people were like, well, can you put one over here? And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> like the stress to open this one location was a lot. And so um, I was like, well, maybe how does this look if I do two locations? And the reason, the only reason that I did a second location was to increase my buying power. It was really never about expansion. When I first came back to D.C. and I decided to open a juice bar, I went to every juice bar owner that I could find in the area because I knew, again, I wasn't getting funding from anywhere. So I had to cut as much as I could in cost without compromising my product. And so I went to every juice bar owner. I was like, hey, how many cases of apples do you use in a week? How many cases of oranges? Like just getting around about because if I can go to a farmer or if I can go to a vendor and say, hey, if I can guarantee that I'm going to buy 150 cases of apples a week, can I lock it in at this price? Because what people do not know about produce, it, it works like the stock market. Ginger can be $17.40 for 30 pounds one day and then literally go as high as $110 the next day, depending on the season. And so every last juice bar owner told me they were not interested. And I'm like, what? Why not? It's literally locking in prices. Like, I don't care about your formula. Like, and I believe that competition is healthy. So it really wasn't even about like a competing with each other. I'm like, listen, I'm going to cut our costs so that we can buy at this rate. No one wanted to do it. So that was really the brainchild of 
I need to have more locations to have more buying power. And so we opened our second location in 2015. And literally like a year and a half after that, we opened our third location. And so we were opening a location almost like every year, year and a half until we got to six. At six is when I started to lose my mind. (laughs) (laughs) How come? What what happened? What was the tipping point at six? So two, you can kind of see it, right? I can still look at my first location and go spend some time at the second location. It was the third location where I was like, I'm not enough. I'm just simply not enough. There's not enough time. There's not enough of me because I'm all, I'm very much a Virgo. I want to see it all. I want it all to be perfect. And once you start expanding, there are compromises, right? Like you're compromised. You're having to trust a team to be the face of your company. You're having to trust, you know, that the product is going to look like what it's supposed to look like. You're trusting that your team is going to tell the customers the correct information until you start to get emails. Like, hey, this was my experience. Sometimes it's not very nice. Sometimes those emails are literally six paragraphs long and it became a lot. And so what we decided to do was like, let's step back from growing horizontally, right? Horizontally. We need to grow vertically. How do we grow vertically? And then that's where books came back into the place. Like, okay, now I need to learn how to scale this thing. And that was a journey within itself, right? Like, cause you're, you're constantly scaling and figuring out what's next for the company. And I thought, oh, I'm going to open stores everywhere, all throughout the country. And then reality kicks in. Like, this is a lot and it takes a lot. What do you know now that you wish you knew when you were first starting out? <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, there's a lot. Um, I think as an entrepreneur, right? Like you're, you're tasked with being the visionary and being a visionary sometimes is a very isolating space. And you want to believe that you can control the vision and and how you execute that vision. Um, The biggest thing is that I I have always needed a team. And the type of team that I've needed has changed throughout the years. Like at first I needed people on the ground and in the store. And then I was like, okay, I don't want to talk to staff anymore. Like now I need someone that's that middle ground. Mm -hmm. And then I needed upper management. And then as you get even bigger, you need a bigger and better team. There's certain things that you just cannot outsource anymore. You need some in-house people. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is that being a visionary can be isolating, but you always need a team of people to be able to get your company from where you, you're you trying to go, like where you are to where you're trying to go. Absolutely. Team is really everything when growing a business because you can't do it alone and you need really no. great people who believe in the vision and can help execute that vision. How did you go about finding the right team to partner with? Stephanie, we're still doing it. <laughs> we're still doing it. Um, so first I had to first identify what my true needs were, right? Like you can say, oh, I need a general manager. I need store managers. I need you know, VP of this or director of that. And so what I did is I laid out an organizational chart and I realized how many pieces of that organizational chart had my name in it. And so I was like, what do I not want to do anymore? (laughs) What do I not want to do? And how can I truly sit in the CEO role? Because I have a responsibility as a CEO. And so I started to identify those things, identifying what I didn't want to do anymore, and also who do I truly need to get this done? Um, there's a saying that I watched this interview um, with some of Oprah's team, and they were talking about how you have this concept that that you think that Oprah comes in and does everything. It's like no, she doesn't. They call it what they call what she does is she comes in and she sprinkles her Oprah on it. So they come to her with, hey, here's the direction for the magazine. Here's the direction for the show. Here's the direction for, you know, whatever it is that she has going on. And she goes down the line and says, okay, I want this to look like this. And I want this to look like that. Take that out. And so I'm like, I want to be Oprah. (laughs) I love it. I want to to come in and just sprinkle my Oprah on it. 
Um, and so how do I do that? And mm-hmm. you think that you just need people and it's not just people, you need qualified people. You need people who truly understand the the job that they're there to do. Um, they have to have a very specific skill set. And I'm not just talking about juicing, right? Because as, as an engineer, again, systems were my thing. I can train you to come in and make perfect smoothie. It's pretty much already done for you, right? You're literally just pressing a button, opening a bag, putting it in a blender. Um, but everything else, what does that look like for us? And so like truly understanding how to hire and thinking about what kind of boss did I want to be, right? Like I'm not the person that walks through the store like, oh, this is my store. I just wanted to be very in the back and support the team as much as I can as the CEO. And, but they'll tell you if I walk into the store, I'm changing mop water, I'm cleaning out the sink, I'm rinsing a blender. And they're literally looking at me like, would you get out of here? <laughs> like, we, we got this part. Go do what it is. Whatever it is that you do, please go do that. That's how you know you definitely have the right team for sure. Tell me about some of the business tools that you've used to help you grow and scale the business over the years. Oh, wow. Um, so recently was one of our biggest investments. Uh, when it came to our business in scaling, which was an ERP system. Um, and that system kind of helps you organize the company when it comes to inventory, supply and chain, um, just any parts, HR, business management. It covers literally a large spectrum of things because I needed to see the company differently. I needed to sit back and look at like, where are we bleeding out? What kind of inventory do we need to have? And so that was one of the things once I decided that I was no longer going to open up any more locations and the pandemic kind of put it out there. Like, how do you get access to your customer when they can't get access to you? Um, and so storefronts and brick and mortar took a big, big hit, especially if you were not deemed essential. Um, and we really had to fight a fight to be deemed essential. Um, And it was more so like thinking about my team, but this ERP system allowed us to see what store was really performing, which store isn't, how to perfect it, um, and get as close to perfection as possible, um, organizing around, do I have too many staff members at this location? Um, Are they not prepping properly? So anything that I couldn't see before, again, because My vision is split into six different spaces, but it also helped us say, hey, we're missing out on a lot of revenue by not having an e-commerce platform, by not shipping our juices, by not being in retail. And when I saw that, I was like, wait, I don't have to open another store to, to make this. I'm leaving money on the table. Um, and so you, when you're talking about juicing, there's a lot of precursors that you do have to take to be able to ship. Because you're talking about a fresh product, you're talking about the weight of the product that can be ridiculous in shipping costs. And so we did a deep dive and said, hey, how can we make this happen? And so we launched our e-commerce platform uh, last December. And it's been going crazy <laughs> um, because DC is government. You know, and so once people come in, sometimes they're only here for four years, depending on, you know, whether it's Congress or whether it's presidential, and then they go back to wherever they're, or they're going wherever that candidate is going. So once they have turned natural, they're literally emailing like, hey, can I get juices? Can I get patties? Can I get whatever? Like, can you ship it to me? And so now that we are able to do that and created a space to be able to do that, it's like, wow, we were missing out all this time. Um, But those are the things that you learn. Was it hard to figure out the process of launching e-commerce having been so used to brick and mortar? Yes. More so because I was just being stubborn. <laughs> That's really it. Um, but also understanding like what products do people truly want? Because you just don't want to throw products out there in hopes that people want them. And so it's like I really had to go back and you know actually talk to the customer. And say, hey, what is it that you want? They want juice cleanses. They want to be able to have juice. They want to turn natural juices in their fridge, no different than they want like Simply Lemonade or Ocean Spray. And so now I'm like, oh, so maybe they need a subscription program where you get juices every month. 
you know, so now it opened up so many different doors, but also the creativity of how to get juices and what to actually get them. What marketing channels did you find were working well for you when you launched e-commerce? Um, Shopify does a lot for you that I did not know. Um, they had at, like you have access to, so they kind of walk you through like all of the email marketing and social media marketing and just the SEO stuff. Like you're like, wow, I've really been missing out on all of this stuff because I just didn't want to ship. <laughs> <laughs> so sh- Shopify, of sh- of course, um, the ERP system that we work with is through NetSuite. So they also provide some marketing channels. Um, and now you're just getting creative and finding like, okay, I can put my information out here and Facebook ads and Instagram ads and, you know, really touching customers without having to sit within this DMV area. And when I say DMV, I'm not talking about Department of Motor Vehicles, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. I'm like, I know what you're talking about being from there. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so I'm glad you clarified because some of our listeners might not know. Are there any other tools that you're using in your business in store that have really helped you scale the business that for someone who's thinking about launching a brick and mortar store should be thinking about? Yeah, we've been with Square for over 10 years. And I think Square is truly underestimated when it comes to, because people think of it as just a point of sale system. And it's so much more than that. And they have really taken advantage of finding out who their customer is as a small business owner, right? Like they're, they're inquisitive. They want to know what you're selling, how you're selling it. What type of management do you need? Whether it's, are you retail? Are you food service? Um, what type of inventory do you keep? Do you need inventory management? Something simply as your team clocking in and clocking out. So having access to that all in one system and not having to have several different applications cover that made it like so much easier. And so people come all the time and say, Hey, how happy are you with Square? I am absolutely happy and I'm not leaving. <laughs> Look, it is so good to find solutions like Square and Shopify and all of the systems that you're mentioning, because I feel like whenever we find these business tools and solutions, we're like screaming them from the rooftops because as a business owner, all you want to do is simplify things and make things easier and make your business run smoother, make your hours if you're not working on your business smoother because you're not getting messages that they're problems. So I love sharing all of these tools to, to, to help everyone. So thank you for... Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Tell me what you're looking forward to next. What's coming up in the business? Sure. Um, So last year, we took on our first investor. Um, We still never got a loan from the bank. (laughs) Even Even after 10 years of proving to be a very successful and profitable business, I will not name the bank. Um, however, you've, they've literally seen cash deposits, electronic deposits, and you're talking about millions of dollars because we've been with them for a very long time. Last year, they offered us a loan for $50,000. Wow. And not to sound ungrateful, but for a business that has revenue of, you know, $4 million, 50,000, I'm going to buy blenders with $50,000. Um, so last year we took on um, our first investor and what I decided to do was to really scale the business in a way that I knew could take it from a regional brand to a national brand. And again, that's with e-commerce, that's with retail, making sure that my product can be in places that I simply cannot like occupy someone else's space. Why go pay rent (laughs) for another brick and mortar (laughs) location and have to have six staff members and have, you know, like, why do that? Go occupy someone else's space. And so using um, that investment to scale the business in a way that I could not have scaled it because Mm -hmm. of resources, again, revenue and cash flow are not the same thing. And so sometimes businesses can't grow because of the lack of cash flow. You're making the money, but I... I don't see it all the time. Like sure. it, it's literally in and out. When you decided to take on working with an investor, what were some of the steps that you took to figure out, you know, how much money you needed to be able to scale when taking on an investor, how much equity to give away? Did you work with anyone to help you figure out that process since you hadn't done it before? So how we met this investor was very untraditional. Um, 
So we were pitched in an email to pitch to the investor. And at first I thought it was a scam email, like, uh, okay. And so my general manager at the time was like, no, we really need to look into this because we're freshly, barely out of the pandemic. And, you know, it's still touch and go. You know, you take, we were blessed to not take such major loss, but we did experience loss, right? And so she's like, let's just do it. And so we traditionally, you wouldn't meet an investor that way. You're not technically going in front of them and pitching with cameras. <laughs> and so we did do that pitch. And at the time, like, of course, you do your due diligence, right? Because there's legal stuff that you have to go through. But there's no one that you truly have as a small business to really properly walk you through what that process looks like. Because sometimes a small business is, I guess you could say, sophisticated enough to have a really good legal team, to have a really good accounting team. And not to say the people that work with us aren't capable, but at that level, when you're talking about, you know, a seven figure investment, it's, it's a little scary. Um, and so looking back on it, what I wish that we would have done was to make sure that the investor was one competent enough, right? Because sometimes we think that money equals intelligence. And what the world is showing us day to day, that is just simply not true. <laughs> um, and so what is the intention, right? What is the intention from the investor? Because a lot of times you're coached as an investor, as a company to ask these questions and to you need to prepare yourself for an investor. You need to look like this. Your financials need to look like that. But not often are we talking about what are some of the things that we need to ask investors? Like, what does your team look like to be able to help me grow my company? Here's my growth strategy plan. Who in your team can help me accomplish that? Is that even your intention, right? Like, do you even have the people that are capable enough to help me execute this? Um, also, like, what is what are their experiences as an investor in small businesses? Because sometimes people are just kind of throwing money at a thing and don't have any experience in it. And so I'm always willing to learn and I'm always like a student of life, of business, whatever it may be. But I also know what I'm doing, right? Like I've been doing this. This has been my my child for 10 years and it's healthy and it's growing and it's a good it's a good kid. <laughs> and so I don't want to just put my child in the hands of someone who really doesn't have an idea. So and it's, it's a true relationship. And how involved are they going to be? You know, are they do they want to know the day to day stuff? Can you truly know the day to day stuff? Like, is this a phone call every single day? Like, OK, today we did this or today nothing actually happened or today I put out a million fires. How involved should this person be? Um, even down to equity, right? Like how much should you be giving up? And for me, it wasn't just about scaling the business. You got to remember, I did this to continue my mother's legacy and forge my own. And so now bringing in partners, what does that look like? You know, do am I compromising the integrity of what I started this for? Um, this doesn't just affect me. It affects my team. It affects the communities that we serve. And so those are the things that we had to take into consideration and really ask ourselves. And I would really urge other small business owners who are looking for investors. Like it's great to get a seven figure check, right? It's, it's phenomenal because in your mind, you're thinking about all the things that you're going to do with that money. But that also comes with another level of responsibility that you have to ask yourself, are you truly prepared for? Absolutely. I'm so glad that you shared all of that because those are such good points that, yes, money is very helpful, but the right money is what's helpful and partnering with the right people who are giving it to you because you want your business to grow and flourish and yeah. only get better and not be bogged down with the wrong people who may not have the right intentions or, or be there to help in the way that you need as a business. So thank you for Absolutely. sharing all of those points. I think that's super, super helpful. Jerry, what is the craziest thing that has ever happened to you in business and starting? <laughs> wow. So many things. I think this is like the craziest and the funniest. 
So this is around the second location. Uh, we had been open maybe for like a year. And there was a guy and a girl that came in. I thought they were mother and daughter. I mean, mother and son. So the guy comes in first. He gets a smoothie and he's asking. So this particular smoothie, I believe, is an acquired taste. It's blueberries, bananas, almond milk, cinnamon, nutmeg, vanilla, and granola, right? Sounds good. (laughs) Sounds good. But then once people get it, you know, nutmeg can be a little tricky Mm. for people. And so he was like, oh, I wasn't expecting it to taste like this. And so, but he he left out. I thought he was okay. So then the girl comes in and she was like, well, he doesn't really like the smoothie. And so, you know, my questions are legit questions because now I need to know not to challenge her. What didn't he like about the smoothie? So I can better suggest something else on the menu. So then um, we're talking. And so, you know, I'm just exchanging and, and having a dialogue with her. And so I was like, oh, okay. So are you his mom? And it wasn't his mom. It was his girlfriend. (laughs) I wanted to melt into the blender. It was so bad. Like I have never been so embarrassed in my life because the look on her face, and especially as from woman to woman, Mm -hmm. you just don't ever want that to happen. Like how did I think that was, she just had a very like motherly, it wasn't like girlfriend or spouse approach to it. It It's very motherly. And so she was like, no, I'm not. And so when he came in and he said, babe, I was like, oh my God, this makes What did you do? <laughs> I just kept blending. I just, <laughs> just kept blending. I just didn't say anything else. I was like, not only am I going to replace your smoothie, I'm going to refund you. I just felt so bad. Um, but I'm pretty sure there was plenty of other crazy moments. And been- there's so many. I know. Every day, ups and downs, <laughs> highs and lows. Roller coaster ride, I say every single day. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> you never know. Well, thank you so much, Jerry, for sharing your journey, your story, the legacy that you have built and left for your mom is so incredible. And thank I feel you. so, so inspired just hearing everything that you've accomplished. It truly is incredible and, and such hard work. My last question for you, or second to last okay. question. How about that? Okay. <laughs> well, what does being an entrepreneurista mean to you? Oh, wow. Um, it's layered. You know, I did not set out to become an entrepreneur. And becoming an entrepreneur became so many good things and so many challenging things, right? And sometimes we like to focus on a lot of the challenges and not the good stuff. Um, the good stuff is that I am financially stable enough that I can live a life that I just really didn't think that I could live. Um, As an aeronautical engineer, I was able to take care of myself, but to leave a very secure job and to go into something that you didn't want to have a skill set for or really know how it was going to turn out, I I count myself blessed to be able to say that. Um, And uh, all that other stuff is amazing people that I work for. And I think we tend to romanticize entrepreneurship when it comes to, oh, I work for myself. I don't. I work for my customers. I work for my team. I I work for my vendors. Like this is a collaborative thing. Like everybody plays a part in this. Um, yeah. I mean, it just is so layered when it comes to all of the stuff that, that, comes together when it comes to being an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurista. Yes. No, I love it. Where can everyone find you, follow you for those that are interested in coming to the store or buying online? Tell me all the links, all the places to go, and we'll link out to everything in the show notes below. Yes. So everything is turning natural. All of our social media handles are turning natural. You can find us at turningnatural.com. Um, me personally, I like to separate myself from the business because as an entrepreneurista, one of the things that I like to do is what I do is not who I am, uh, is just a part of it. And so if you want to personally follow me, um, my personal handle is Jerry Chanel, J E R I Chanel, like the designer, which is literally my name. It's not like a full <laughs> thing. Um, but like I said, everything is turning natural, you know, juices, cleanses. We're developing more stuff like our black bean burgers, our vegan patties and pastries um, that will soon be all available on e-commerce. But juices are available now. 
Amazing. Well, I am ordering. I can't wait to try them. And Jerry, congrats again on everything Thank you've you. accomplished. It is so incredible and so excited to stay in touch and continue to see all the, the great things you will do. And Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I think this is an amazing platform, um, especially like you said, when you come in, you come into this, you don't know a lot and you're looking for resources and sometimes the resources aren't there and resources always isn't capital capital. Sometimes it's information. Absolutely. And sharing stories like yours and all of your learning lessons are going to help so many entrepreneurs who maybe haven't started yet and now have a lot of learnings that that you just shared. So thank you again, Jerry. I'm Stephanie, and this is the best business meeting I've ever had.